Uh, let's turn to Jeremiah 17. So, um, in my quiet times, this is kind of the book I've been going through uh, and personally reading. And every time I get up here and I talk about a book I've been going through, I, I call it my favorite book. And um, right now, this is my favorite book. And, and I was just talking to Mitch about it, and I was like, I don't know why, because ba uh, basically, Jeremiah is trying to get this country, uh, southern Israel, um, basically named Judah, to return back to the Lord because they're going to be judged. And what we know of um, southern Israel is this named Judah, it's going to be judged because it will not return to the Lord. And it's the northern part Israel, um, named in the Bible, basically a um, hundred years before this, actually, I think it's in 722 B.C., is captured by the Assyrians. They watched that whole thing. And here we're in the kind of probably the early 600s B.C. Um, and they're not list they're not using that as an example to turn back to the Lord. They're deep in idolatry, and Jeremiah has um, been given the um, right, been given the call to speak against his own nation and say, "Hey, you need to turn and back, walk back to the Lord." Um, and when I go to this passage in Jeremiah 17, it's really talking about um, choosing to walk or not walk with the Lord. And, and it also gives us instructions or gives us a basic understanding of human nature, talking about the heart. There's actually a really familiar passage in this as we go through it. It's a verse we, a lot of us know, you know, the heart is deceitfully the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And we'll talk about that as we get, go through this passage. But um, Jeremiah's ministry um, spans about 40 years, I think, um, during about five kings of Judah, um, the southern king kingdom. It's approximately about 100 years after Isaiah's. Um, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, right? He's so concerned about his nation. He's trying to get them back, and they just won't listen. Um, so his message often consisted of deep sorrow over the nation, um, talking about the upcoming destruction of Jerusalem and the fact that their people are going to be exiled out of that nation um, and taken by the Babylonians. Really, uh, there's a verse that kind of sums up his ministry in Jeremiah 26, 12 through 15, and I'll read this real quick. It says, Then Jeremiah spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with, with all the words that you have heard. Now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord, your God. Then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. As for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. But now for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on the city and on the, its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. And really sums up his ministry as he's speaking to the southern kingdom of Judah. And what I see in this book really is God's patience, right? Um, it calls God's judgment a strange work in the book of Isaiah. The fact that he waits and waits and waits to judge a nation after giving them mercy, grace, warning, and yet, um, in this book, we see that Jeremiah is going to pronounce some judgment that God's going to bring down on them, and he's pretty blunt about it. And yet, in that same message, he's giving them an opportunity to change and asking them that they would um, relent from their ways, from their idolatry, from their departing from the Lord. And when, I, when we go through this passage, I, I think of a verse um, it's found in the book of Matthew. Um, it's Matthew 7, 13 and 14. You guys are probably familiar with this verse. It says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. And really, this talks, this passage talks about the difference between going the broad way and the narrow way. And you'll see it as we go through it. Um, so we'll start reading in... Chapter 17, verse 5, and we'll finish in verse 10, and then we'll pray and we'll get into it. It says, 
In verse 5, thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land which is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart, I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Let's pray. Oh, Lord, um, again, just thank you for the opportunity to go through your word. And Lord, as we read this, I just ask that we would examine our own lives and see what road we're headed on, Lord. And it could just be with some of our just parts of our lives. We're just headed the wrong way, Lord. And you want us to repent, change our mind, and return going back towards you, Lord. And just ask that you would do this as we go through this passage um, to each one of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first part of this we see talks about the Broadway, the cursed. He says, um, cursed is a man. And this is obviously not a good thing. And cursed is not, you know, I don't have to explain that to you, right? And it's the idea of just a miserable existence. Um, and why? Why is his way, why is this individual's way cursed? Now, in the context, um, it says because he trusts in man. And when we're talking about the context of this passage, we're talking about Judah, who's thinking at this moment that Egypt's going to help them um, get out of judgment, that, Judah, that Egypt's going to help save them. So they're trusting in the nation of Egypt um, against the Assyrians, against the Babylonians. And yet we know that does not happen. Actually, the Babylonians um, take out first the Assyrians and then Egypt themselves and then takes over Judah um, probably about 20 years after this is written um, in 586. But they're trusting in man and... Um, when I think of uh, trusting in man, I think of the middle verse of the Bible. Does anybody? I always ask the junior high. Um, I've heard that this is the middle verse of the Bible. It's Psalm 118.8. And I know this because, well, it was said by a pastor, but, uh, you know, but it, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter. Psalm 118 is right in the middle of it. And Psalm 118.8 says, it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. So now you know the middle verse of the Bible. Hopefully, I, I don't know how they figured that out. I've heard there's, there's 596 chapters before that, 596 chapters after that, and it's the middle chapter. Um, I actually, I thought I counted this out one time, um, just to find out if it, it was accurate. But I don't know, but I've heard, I think of that verse as far as trusting in man versus trusting in God. And God obviously wants you to trust in him, right? We're not called to trust in man. We're not supposed to put confidence in man. Um, Paul describes it uh, in Galatians, for I do not persuade, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Right? And, you know, when I really think about what God changed, what God has been changing in my life, right, um, since I became a believer, it's really, the work he's doing in my life is, he's been telling me that I need to follow him and please him and not care so much about what people think, right? I need to put my trust in him and not lean on other people. Because growing up, I was a people pleaser, right? I, you know, I got in all sorts of trouble because of it, right? It's, you know, the thing was always, you know, with my friends is, you know, they would challenge, I don't think Kyle would do this, right? And they would say that, and that would lead me to doing something dumb. Right, and it happened all the time. And, you know, my brothers still do it when it comes to uh, lifting things. Like, um, hey, I don't think Kyle can lift this, right? And, you know, 10 seconds later, I'm trying to lift something. I 
really should not be lifting. Right? It's getting less and less now that I'm getting older and older. Um, there's actually a story when I met my wife. I went, the first time I think she met my parents, uh, maybe early on in, my, in our dating life. We didn't have a long dating period, right? It's three or four months before I got married. But um, I was over at my parents' house, and my brother challenged me to, he says, I don't think Kyle can run down to the lake, back up to the top of the hill, down to the lake again, back up to the top of the hill in 20 minutes. And, of course, I took that as a challenge. My wife's there. I, I think it might, she might have been my girlfriend at that time. I'm like, oh, I've got to do this, right? And by the t- second time I'm going down this lake, to this lake, and we live on a hill, and I would imagine it's a steep hill. Yeah, Nick's seen it, right? It's a steep hill, and I thought, oh, I could do this, right? By the second time I'm going down this hill, my legs feel like jelly. I'm surprised I didn't fall on my face, and I didn't. I made it back up. I don't think I quite got in in 20 minutes, but it took me at least three hours to recover. I was on my back, my parents' back lawn, thinking, what did I get myself in? I actually think I got $20 for it. I don't remember. Right? And then I got the story now. I don't think he ever paid me either. Um, but all to tell you, that was kind of my lifestyle, you know, before I met the Lord. I was always about pleasing man. I was more worried, you know, I was worried about what my buddies thought of me. I was worried about those things. And God has, you know, been working in me to make me realize that I need to worry about what he thinks. Um, that's the thing I need to be following. And here we have a nation that's putting their trust in, in another nation rather than putting their trust in God. And they know who this God is. They have a history with this God. You know, um, the southern kingdom, the whole nation of Israel has a past, and yet they are a, start leaning on, leaning on somebody else rather than God. And it also says um, they were making flesh their strength, Right? And whether they're depending on themselves or depending on another nation, they were not depending on God, right? And they thought it was their ability or their, you know, characteristics that would get them out of this, right? Um, You know, whether it's the, uh, you know, and I always think when I think about this, one of the first um, things I remember when I came to this church was, um, one of the pastors saying, it's really not your ability that God wants to use. It's your availability. And I've always take that to heart, right? Because, you know, he's, you know, he doesn't take, you know, it's the first Corinthians passage. It talks about God's toolbox um, and it talks about he doesn't take the wise of this world, right? Because who's going to get the glory in that situation? You know, and my dad would always ask, um, you know, why doesn't he just use people that can speak really well to be behind and give sermons. And he has in the past. But, you know, a lot of times he doesn't use that because who would get the glory then, right? It wouldn't be God. It would be the individual, right? You you see that in sports today. I was just talking about this to my junior high. You know, what I don't like about athletes today, they always recognize themselves a lot. You know, whenever they do anything on the court or on the field or, right, they pound their chest and, you know, thank themselves when, you know, I'm thinking God's up there thinking, you know, I just gave you your next breath. I just made you 6'5". I'm the one who gave you your height. All those things that God did for this individual, and yet they congratulate themselves. And I know it takes a lot of hard work, takes athletic ability, but all that stuff is granted by God in a sense. And we need to realize that we can't rely on our strength. We need to rely on the Lord. Um, And you know, if we put our, um, we rely on individuals, right? Have you ever been let down by another person? I, hopefully, <laughs> never, right? Um, yes, you know, you put your, you know, you rely on different individuals in your life, and they're bound to let you out, let you down, right? And maybe not pers- purposefully, purposeful, um, purposely, sorry, that's the word, um, but sometimes, you know, it just happens, Right? They promise they're going to do something, and they just don't follow through. Right? My wife, I love her to death, but she has not a very good memory. Right? So if she says she's going to do something, I have to remind her maybe a few times. Right? And, um, you know, and, you know, some people are just, they're going to let you down. 
if you put your trust and you rely on their strength rather than God's. And I think of relying on myself, you know. How many of you guys have set New Year's goals, right? Um, and how many are actually fulfilled those in this last, where are we on? We're in the eighth month. How are you doing on your New Year's goal eight months ago? And I, you know, I, I was thinking one of mine was to read through the Bible. And the first three months I was solid. Um, I was right on pace. I had this note card in my, to keep track. And I was doing great. And I actually told some guys I was doing great that that's probably where my first mistake was. And now I look back at it, and I'm going to have to make up some ground, right, in order to finish the Bible in one year, right? And I try not to count, you know, the passages I'm studying for and different things like that, of just the ones I do in my quiet times. And I'm behind. So, you know, I've let myself down. I, I even think in my, um, you know, as far as relying on my strength um, um, in the past, you know, uh, you know, those things are going to fade. Your flesh is going to give way. Um, you can't re- keep on relying on it. Um, you guys know as you age, right, you're not as fast, you're not as strong, you're not as smart as you used to be, right? That stuff just fades over time. And it's something we need to realize that, you know, our dependability on Christ needs to increase, right, as we grow in our relationship with the Lord. That's where we need to be. Um, I was... I just actually listened to, you know, I never really get to hear Steve teach anymore because <laughs> um, I'm always in the junior high room. Um, occasionally, now, he, now I come on Wednesday nights so I can hear him teach. But um, one of his last studies, he went through Zechariah 4, Zechariah 4, and he was talking about just um, use, allowing the Holy Spirit to work in your life. And I love that passage it's in Zechariah 4, 6. It says, not by might nor by power, but by God's Spirit. That's what we need to rely on. That's what God's asked us to do. And this person that is being cursed is, right, they're trusting in man. They're making flesh their strength, right, whether it's their, their flesh, whether it's them or relying on other, other people. That's going to fail you. God will not. And because of that, it says their heart, heart is departing from the Lord. Um, and when I think of their heart departing from the Lord, I think it's, it's really the opposite of repentance. The repentance is the idea of changing. God changes your mind, and you start going towards him, right? He changes your mind, and then he starts changing your direction. Instead of going away from the Lord, you start returning to the Lord. And here, these guys are not repentant, and they're departing from the Lord, right? Because they're not trusting, they're trusting in man over God, and they're making flesh their strength rather than relying on, again, the Lord. And then he gives, after he gives this description of what it is to be cursed, he gives us a picture, right? And he uses a simile to do this. And he says, like a shrub in the desert. What a perfect illustration for us. You guys, all you do is have to drive in any highway around here, you see enough shrubs. And we kind of live in a semi-desert, right? It's a picture here. And the shrub, it says, um, let's see where we're at. It says, for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, right? And it's the idea of being blind, you know? And I think of the uh, Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes in the New Testament, how often Jesus Christ was right in front of them. And he would tell them that, and yet they were so blind um, because, right, um, they relied on themselves. They didn't. Um, actually understand what the scripture said. Um, and God made that apparent when he says, you guys search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are which testify of me. He's right there in front of him saying, hey, I'm here. I'm fulfilling scripture right in front of you guys, and you guys know what the scriptures say, and yet you're missing it, right? Um, you're blind, and that's what this picture is when you're, you're trusting in man, you're trusting in the flesh, right, and your heart's departing from God, you're not seeing the good that's presented right in front of you, right in front of you. Um, the old saying, you're missing the forest from the trees, right, you're so f- focused on the tree in front of you, you're missing the bigger picture, and that's what it seems like with these, these guys in the New Testament. Um, I also, when I think of this, I... If you guys don't know, Braveheart is my favorite movie. 
and I think of a passage from Braveheart. I, anytime I get a quote, Braveheart, I, I try to take advantage of it. Um, and I thought when I was going through this passage, I thought of that um, at one point when um, Braveheart looks at him and he says, you guys are so concerned with squabbling for the scraps of Longshank, Longshank's table that you've missed your God-given right to something better, right? They're missing the point, right? The fact that they could go after freedom rather than just take uh, the bits of Longshank's table, right? And I don't want to explain that whole passage, you guys, if you haven't seen Braveheart. Yes, um, there's some good parts of Braveheart, right? But um, all to say is um, they're missing the good part, right? When they're on the way, they're on the broad way, when they're on the cursed way, when they're not looking towards the Lord, they're looking for other ways out. They think they have better plans, and right, they can't even see that here Jeremiah is in front of them. And I think about all the prophets and all the individuals God put in their way, in Israel's way, in Judah's way, to say, hey, turn around. Look, return to the Lord, and he's going to relent. He's not going to do this to you. Right? Yet they would not. He threw some good things in their way, and yet they would not turn. Um, and it says, continuing with this picture, it says they're going to inhabit the parched places. The idea they're just going to be, you know, a shrub seems like it's alone out there. It's, right? It's, um, you know, just talking about it makes you thirsty, right? Seeing a shrub by itself in the desert, right? It's not doing what it's, right? In the fact that it's not by water. It's not being um, supplied for, right? Um, not being fulfilled. You know, your expectations continually fr frustrated because um, you're not in the right place. Um, Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Right? He has good works for each one of us to do. And when we're not on the way, on the narrow way, we're not listening to the Lord or being obedient to him, um, we're basically on a path that's not good, right? And it says we're in a salt land inhabited, right? And that's the idea of just, you know, not a lot of things grow in a salt land, right? We have the salt sea, um, the Dead Sea, which is filled with a lot of salt, and there's not a lot of living there. I don't think there's anything living there, um, not for sure, but um, we have a salt land that's inhabited, right? And the Bible's clear, um, John 15:5. One of my, my favorite verses, it says, for without me, you can do nothing, right? Without a relationship with Christ, without Christ working in you, there's really no good you can do. And um, here, these individuals think um, they can do it without the Lord, and yet they're on the wrong path. And the cool thing is, he doesn't just leave it there. He goes on to talk about the narrow path, the narrow way. And he gives us a description, and he says the person's going to be blessed. And from the New Testament, when we talk about blessed, it's the idea of just being happy. Oh, how happy, right, is that person who trusts in the Lord, right? And we have a huge passage in the Bible, um, a huge chapter actually dedicated for people putting their trust in the Lord. And it's Hebrews 11, right? The hall of faith is what we call it. It's faith. It's just another word for trust. It's another word for believe. In the New Testament, when you see believe, it's the same word you use for faith. It's the same word you use for trust. Um, it's the same Greek word. And it just means to trust in, to rely on, to cling to. That's what faith means. Um, and here, when you put your trust in the Lord, you're not going to be unsatisfied. Um, and in this passage, when I'm thinking of Hebrews 11, I think of Enoch. And let me read just a couple verses on him. It says, By faith, Enoch was taken away, so he did not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So I'll just take a couple words from that passage and talk about it real quick. Um, pleasing God. And... You know, when I went through this passage with the junior hires, it was a long time ago, a couple years ago, 
I went through each of these examples of what faith looks like in the uh, New Testament in the Hebrews 11. And here we have Enoch. And what did Enoch do? He pleased God. We don't know a lot about this guy, right? But we know that he pleased God. So when I, I saw that, I was like, so what pleases God? And I went straight to the scriptures and um, found verses that talk about pleasing God. And one of them was in John 8, 29, when Jesus says, doing the will of the Father, that pleases him. Doing what God's asked you to do, that pleases him. Paul, I just read the passage in Galatians 1, 10. It says it pleases God when um, you put trust, you put your trust in him rather than man, when it, that is the circumstance. And Timothy says, you please God when you know who you serve, right? He says, no one goes to war without understanding who they're serving. And we need to know who we work for, who we're a bond servant to, and that's Christ, right? And in 1 Thessalonians 4, another passage talking about pleasing God, and it says, you know, it's just walking what you've been taught. You, you hear God's word, and then you apply it. That pleases God. And he says also in this passage about Enoch, it says, without faith, it's impossible. And we know in the flesh, without trusting, with relying on ourselves or relying on man, that does not please God. And um, it's impossible. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And um, I take a passage from Romans 8, 5 through 8, in the NIV, actually. It says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on the, what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on the, what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is, is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. And again, without faith, without trusting in the Lord, it's impossible to please God. And, you know, I don't know about you, but um, most of you guys are here on a Sunday night because you want to know what God's speaking to you about. And most of us want to please God. And, you know, the Bible's clear on that, um, on that subject. And it has to happen with trust. We need to trust in him rather than man. And this, again, this whole picture here in Jeremiah is there's a contrast between somebody who puts their trust in God and somebody who's leaning on them themselves or on other people rather than God. And he also says in this, going back to Jeremiah 17, it says, blessed is a man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. And I love that word hope in the, uh, in the Bible because it's not the hope that we, we're always taught, you know, like I hope I win the lottery if I buy this ticket. And I haven't bought a lottery ticket since, I think since I was 18, right? just because I could at 18, but, um, so I'm never going to win, so I don't really hope in that, but that hope is, you know, it's a hope, so it's the idea that you, you might, you know, have a chance, um, with the lottery, it's really not a chance, but, um, instead, the Bible talks about a hope, it's the idea of an anticipated outcome, it's something that's going to happen, right, um, when the Bible talks about hope, it's something we know it's going to happen, and when we put our hope in the Lord. We know what he said about himself, what he's promised us is going to happen, right? Um, and it's because it's based on him, right? If we give you the example of putting your faith on man versus putting your faith in God, and there's a passage talking about this in 1 Timothy 2.13. It says, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, right? And I, I would, I, you know, if I had a Kyle version of the Bible, I would say when we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself, right? Because we're going to fall. Again, we're going to let people down. And sometimes not with, with that intention, right? We just might forget. Um, we do all sorts of things, you know, or we overpromise. you know. Now I have a calendar system my wife has developed for me. So I can't overpromise. Well, I still do. But, you know, I'm looking at my schedule. I never thought I'd be that person. Um, but I have a schedule, and right? And sometimes we just mix up our schedule. So we promise something, and, you know, and we just can't fulfill it, right? And, you know, again, that's letting somebody down. 
And the Bible says, God never lets somebody down. He is faithful, right? We may not understand exactly what he's doing, right? And how he's doing it or why he's doing it. But again, he says he cannot be unfaithful. He cannot deny himself. It's his character, which is a cool thing. And um, as we had a picture of the shrub in the desert, he gives us a picture of a blessed man in that he gives a picture of a tree and a tree planted by waters, right? The idea that there's provision there. Um, and this is similar to the uh, Psalm, Psalm 1, if you guys read this. A lot of it's, it's probably where Jeremiah got some of this that David wrote in Psalm 1. Um, but it says he provides in the fact that this tree is going to be planted by waters. And it's a picture of somebody who's blessed, right? It's sustenance. I think of, you know, the woman at the well, right? And he says, you know, I can provide water so you would thirst no more, right? There's a satisfaction there that God, only God can give us, right? And when I think of Ephesians 2.10, which I read earlier, uh, he says, you know, we are his workmanship, creating Christ Jesus for good works. Um, when you're, you know, Steve often uses the tool analogy, or if you're a hammer, you know, hammers are designed for one thing, right? Driving in nails or maybe pulling nails out too, right? They're not designed to mow your lawn, you know? They're not designed. I use a hammer in all sorts of ways and just because I'm not that um, um, crafty. Um, but they're designed for one thing. And if they're doing something else, right, they, they have the possibility of breaking. They have all sorts of, they're not doing what they're called to do, right? And God has a calling for each one of us. We're, be, we're called to do certain things, and that's what he says right here, that um, he's going to plant you by waters. He's going to provide for you, um, and the location, I, I like, when I think of this, when you're pl planted by waters, and he's providing for you, um, you see your location, where you're at in life, as not an accident, but um, as an opportunity. Um, a verse in Acts 17 says, And he has made for one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and their boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. I think of this tree being located by the, by the water that's providing for it. And I think of the fact that it's not an accident. Right? When God's blessing you, he's going to give you opportunities. Uh, in junior high this morning, we talked through the church in Philadelphia and the fact that they're being faithful to keep God's word. They're being faithful to not deny his name. And he says, because of that, I'm going to provide you an open door. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Um, and because of the placement of that city, Philadelphia, because it was kind of a doorway from the east, from the west to the east, at that moment in time, God used that as a missionary place. Um, and, you know, and God has you planted in certain places. And if you're focused on him, right, he's going to provide. And he's going to use that as an opportunity to reach people that, again, that might never set foot in this building. That might never um, get to hear the gospel besides from you. Right, and that's family members and different things like that. So take care, take those opportunities. Um, and he also says this tree spreads out its roots, right? And I think of a foundation, the actual potential for growth, right? Matthew seven, one of the first things I ever remember as a child going to Sunday school was the wise man who built his house upon the rock. Right? You guys know that song, you know, versus the foolish man who built his house on the sand, right? That whole picture of having a foundation based in Jesus, right? The foundation provides an opportunity to grow. And when I think of grow, um, Matthew 13 talks about the seed that falls on good ground, right? And it's the seed being the word of God, right? And it yields a crop, some 100-fold, some 60, some 30. And it's the idea that we, if we allow God to work in our lives, allow his word to speak to us, right? Whether it's good or bad, you know. The Bible says all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, 
which is correct teaching, for reproof, right? For that's um, what's not going right in your life, right? For correction, how to get it right, and for training in righteousness and how to stay right. So God's, all that, all scripture is God breathed, right? He's using that in each one of our lives. And are we using that to, again, yield a crop, some hundredfold, some 60, some 30, right? And this is, a, again, going back to the picture, and he says without fear or anxiety, right? It's the idea that this tree is protected. Um, and when I think of living a life without fear, I think of somebody who's just so focused on the Lord, right? He's not looking at the circumstances, right? Um, you know, the Bible says, you know, perfect love casts out fear. And I don't know about you, but I only know of one thing that's perfect in love, and that's Christ, right? And that's God. And that's what we need to concentrate. And that, that's what takes away fear. And it says when heat comes, let me actually read this. And, um, For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and when, will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green, and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Um, and it says when heat comes, and I think of that as the idea that we're going to have trials, temptations, the Bible's promised us that you know i think of when I, I read out the verse of the narrow way right and when it's talking about the narrow way it says you know because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way it doesn't promise us to have an easy easy way living as a christian but he does promise us to help us he does promise to be there for us he does promise us if we lean on him he's going to do work in your life and he's going to provide that for you. Um, and he says, when the heat comes, um, it's not going to be it's not going to be afraid of the heat. And it also says, when the year of drought comes, and that's the idea that you know that these things are coming. But if your focus is on the Lord, you know you can get through it, right? He's going to provide for you. He doesn't want you to be anxious. He commands you not to be anxious in the book of Philippians, right? Do not be anxious, but by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, make your request known to the Lord, right? And he promises these things when, again, it's focused. And now he, when we're, we're talking about a tree, right? And, you know, I don't know about you, but I've never seen a tree that's afraid, right? So it's obviously a picture of us, a, a tree that's afraid or anxious, you know. If you've seen that, then I don't know. It's not a good thing, but if you see, you know, he's obviously talking about an individual that is, again, focused and trusting in the Lord because they they don't have fear. They don't have anxiety, right? And if we have those things, again, we need to turn it over to the Lord and say, hey, obviously my eyes are off of you. Please help me return my eyes to you, right? And because of that, it says this tree yields fruit, right? It's producing Right, and you guys all seen that illustration Steve gives. I love it. You know, you don't see a tree working, right? You don't see it just tense, trying to produce something, right? It's God using, you know, nature basically to produce fruit out of that tree, right? And it's the same thing with us. If we lean on Him, He's going to produce the fruit in our lives, right? It's not, again, our ability that He uses. It's our availability. It's just somebody who wants to be obedient to what God says. And then we get into this last section of this, and it's talking about our heart. Let me read it real quick, and we'll get into it. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. Right? So I just described two paths, somebody who's cursed and somebody who's blessed. And it's all based on where their focus is, who they're focused on who they're following, right? And what path are you on? What path are we on? You know, and um, I, I think it really starts with a good understanding of our sin nature. And here God really presents it pretty easily, the fact that our heart is deceitful above all things. And do we believe this? Um, we have a society that still believes if you're 51% good, 
you're 49% bad, you're going to heaven, right? And I just think of my 25 years without Christ, and I don't think I could spend the rest of my life making up to get to that 51%, really. And, you know, I wasn't a horrible kid, right? But I could just, thing after thing, um, you know, I just wouldn't be able to make up to that 51%. But that's not what the Bible says gets you into heaven, right? I always tell the kids, you're, you know, um, um, who is that lady? Um, Calcutta, Mother Teresa, right? And usually when I tell the junior hires Mother Teresa, they don't know who she is, right? So we need a teacher. But I go, Mother Teresa, with all the good she did in her life, did not make it to heaven because of the good things she did, right? She gave up her whole livelihood to um, help orphans and stuff like that. She didn't make it into heaven because of that. The only reason she made it into heaven is if she believed on Christ and trusted him for her salvation, right? You're 99.9% good. You're still not making heaven, right? It's trusting in him, right? The Bible says it's grace alone that gets you in. So when we say our heart is deceitful above all things, and I, th- I think of this, I think, well, I'm still better than some people, right? And we all have that idea that, you know, I read the paper daily. I don't know why, because I'm disgusted with a lot of individuals. But I understand that, you know, apart from grace, apart from God, that I could be in the paper written in some of those scenarios easily. I never th- thought I could, but then I look at my pr- past, and I, I said things. I told myself there are things I would not do. And every time I did that, I did them, right? I just went, you know, just because of the, the fact that sin controlled my life. And, you know, I understand that, you know, those things that are heinous, you know. And unfortunately, I show my wife. I don't know if I should because she's not really happy about some of the stories I show um, in the paper. You know, they talk about just crazy events that these people are doing, right? But it's because the heart is deceitful above all things. And these are people that are not understanding that they need to go the narrow way. They need to put their trust in Christ. That's what's going to help them. That's what's going to clean up their heart, right? Um, You know, and it says that word deceitful is actually the same word we use for Jacob, right? That's where Jacob gets his name. Deceitful means supplant, supplanted, right? And that's where Jacob names come from. Right? You can say the heart is Jacob above all things, right? Kind of the same idea. Um, but the Bible is clear on that in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, it says Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. Right? Um, I always love this quote by a pastor. It says, If I knew what was on your mind, I would not be speaking to you. But if you knew what was on my mind, you would not want to listen to me, right? And I always think that, you know, because you guys know your heart, right? And hopefully I'm not trying to convince you guys that your heart's deceitful. If you have a problem with that, you can come up here and I'll I'll convince you, hopefully, by just using scripture, right? I, I love the word of God, right? That what shows me where my heart's often at, right? There's a passage here that I've been trying to memorize in the book of um, Jeremiah, and it says, um, it's Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock into pieces? It's the idea of just bringing your heart before the Lord, and the Lord's going to burn away the evil. He wants to use his word in your life to show you where you're at. And hopefully, again, you don't think that um, being better than somebody makes your heart good, right? Um, your heart's deceitful. And it says it's even desperately wicked, right? It won't limit itself. And you see passages in the Bible, right? It doesn't take us to Genesis, to Genesis 6, when um, this is God's estimation of the world at that point. Genesis 6, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Right? That's where we are in Genesis 6. Um, just brief into our history as humanity. Because of sin um, and our sin nature, we have to understand that our heart left alone, right, without Christ, without his word, 
speaking into it is on a bad, bad path, right? Um, and it's desperately wicked, it says. Um, you know, and you, you can look at the newspaper, you can watch the news to see where our society's going on certain issues, right? Um, and sometimes we like to rename things so it, it makes us feel better. Um, but sin is sin, and it's causing destruction in people's lives, and a lot of it is because of our heart. Our, our heart is bent towards sin. Um, I always think about Steve when he, Steve always says people are, are crazy, right? And that's kind of his new attitude, right? And you see that. Um, and it's because they're bent towards sin. And, um, you know, I, I get to see this exampled in my life when I think about the heart being de deceitful and desperately wicked. I, you know, I look at my children, right? Not saying they're bad kids, but, you know, I didn't have to teach them to lie. I didn't have to teach them to sin, right? Um, those things they do routinely, not routinely, but they do um, without me and my wife ever teaching them how to do it, right? And, you know, some of them want to, you know, some of our kids are sneaky. I mean, they have different char characteristics. And what one of our goals is for our children is, one, to help protect them from themselves, right? To teach them that, hey, it's leaning on God that's going to help your heart. It's not, right? It's not trying to do better, you know, using your own strength to say, I'm not going to do this, right? It's understanding that your heart is bent towards sin. It is wicked. And the only thing that can help it is trusting in Christ and asking him to help fix your heart problem because we all have that heart problem, right? And, you know, just take off from here and somebody cut you off. And you can tell me where your heart's at, right? At that point, are you screaming at him, you know? Um, you know, behind the wheel, me and my wife are two different, uh, we have two different philosophies, right? Um, and I won't, actually, I won't go into that, you know, but um, we have two different philosophies. I'm, I'm just laid back, right? I, I just believe everybody's having a bad day, right? And my wife's not in that same vein, right? She's mad, and she wants to revoke their license, as soon as they, you know, get out of the car, right? And you guys all understand that, right? We all have those attitudes. Um, and it's part of it just because of my laid-back nature, right? And I've been anxious at times with drivers. But, you know, that just kind of shows you where your heart is. and not, you know, um, you know, there's other issues. I, you know, one of my pet peeves is standing in line. You know, I just think of ways of which I could get rid of the people in front of me in lines, Right? <laughs> Um, that's where my heart's at, right? And all I'm sitting there thinking, like, how can I remove these five people in front of me, right? And all the ways in which I can do it. And that's where my heart's at, right? And I'm simply waiting, you know, just to buy something, which, you know, it's crazy, right? But that's kind of, those are just examples. And then we can go through each one of us um, of examples of where our hearts are, you guys. And we need to understand that we need a cleaning. We need a cleaning on a daily basis. That's why God wants us to be on the narrow way. That's why he wants us to choose him, to trust in him. Because here, again, you guys, he's given his estimation of our heart. Right? He started out in verse 5, thus says the Lord. And then he goes into verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. He knows where your heart's at. Right? Because he says before that, in verse 9, who can know it? Right? Do we know our hearts? Do we know how bad they can get? Like I said, I always thought I was okay because I was better than you know the person um, in the paper who was killing people because I had never killed someone, right? And I was then when I came into a relationship with the Lord, I realized really my heart was wicked, right? And the only thing that helps change that is a relationship with Him and the fact that He's trying to conform it to be more like His, right? Um, you know, and, you know, we have a society, again, bent towards the idea that society is actually getting better, right? In the last hundred years, you know, the wars that we've been through um, would just prove to you that society hasn't gotten any better, right? Statistics say, I, I think more people have died in the last hundred years in war than the 1900 years before that or something like that. And um, just showing that our society is not getting better because, again, we have individuals not leaning on the Lord, not trusting in the Lord, knowing that 
He's our solution. Um, and so God's picture of our heart here is found in verse 10. And it says, I search the heart, right? I know it's death. I know where your heart can lead you, right? And he's the only one qualified. He's the one, right? You can fool all sorts of people, right? You can be this good person on the outside, and you can fool me. You can fool any one of us, right? But you're never going to fool God. He knows where your heart's at. He knows what your heart looks like, right? The Bible's clear on what your heart looks like. So we all can, you know, you know, look at each other's hearts really knowing that they're desperately wicked. They're deceitful. And it's only, again, leaning on the Lord. Um, David's explanation found in Psalm 139. I love, I love this passage. Psalm 139, it says, O Lord, you have searched me and know me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. In verse 6, it is high. I cannot attain it. David knew that he didn't even know the depths of his own heart and how bad it was, right? Paul, speaking in the New Testament, says, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord, right? Even, he's basically saying, hey, you know, even if I don't think there's anything wicked in my heart, I know God knows it, and, you know, and I'm not justified because I think I'm okay with, you know, I'm okay because my heart's cleaned at this point, right? But it's God who knows my heart. Um, and when I think of this search in the heart, I've been going through the book of Revelation with the junior high, and we've been in chapter two and three, talking about the seven churches um, found there. And, um, and it's really Christ's estimation of what, where the church is at. And he's, in five of these seven churches, he's asking for repentance, He's telling you guys, hey, we need a change of mind. We need to turn around. And again, he's talking to Christians within these churches that you guys need to change your minds. You need to get on board with me. You need to quit looking at the world and put your trust in me. And it then goes on to say he not only searches the heart, he tests the mind. Um, I then we turn back to Psalm 139 where David's conclusion, and this is kind of where... Um, we should all get to um, as we go through this study. And this has been, you know, a prayer of mine. And actually, I, you know, I haven't actually prayed this in a long time, but after doing this study, it's one of the things I did early on in my um, walk with the Lord. Um, I got to this Psalm 139, and it says, you know, uh, let me read it real quick. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. It's right, just realizing that God's the only one who can help fix your heart problem. He's the one we need to go to. He's the one who can help um, fix, you know, your aches and pains, your anxieties, just your attitudes, those things. If, and we need to give it to the Lord. And um, we get to make choices there. Um, I, I like the book of Romans. It says a man is without an excuse. You know, we have a choice here presented in this passage. You can go the broad way or the narrow way. I kind of named this the broad or narrow way, um, this, this study, um, because we get to make a choice. Um, and here God presents the fact that you need to understand that your heart left alone is not a good thing. Um, and he then pronounces his judgment. He's going to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. And um, no one here wants to be judged according to their works, right? It's not a good thing. We want to be judged, right? I would rather be judged according to the fruit um, that was done in my life through Christ, right? And that's the idea that I have a relationship with Christ and he's only going to be judging the things I did or said I did through him right, rather than judged by my works. Because if you're judged by your works, that gets you in hell because the wages of sin is death. It's not a good thing, right? And I always think of this question when I'm thinking about um, works and ways in which what am I doing with my life? The question always comes up is, what have I done with his son? When God asks you, what did you do with his son? 
right? And do you want to hear that good and faithful servant? Or is he going to say, depart from me, I never knew you? And that's found in that same Matthew 7 passage, I think. Um, the fact that some people thought they were doing things for the Lord, and in fact, they weren't trusting in him. They weren't leaning on him. And what God wants us to do is lean on him because he understands the condition of our heart. We need to understand the condition of our heart. And because of that, we need to trust in him. And I'm going to close out right now with that. Uh, Lord, just thank you for your word. Thank you um, that you make it clear that we have, two, we have a choice to make in our lives. We could either follow, follow you, which leads to life, or um, choose not to follow you, which leads to destruction, death, and eventually hell, Lord. And you want us to be on that path that you created for each one of us, that you provided for each one of us by the death of your son. And I just thank you for that. I thank you um, that those here have made that choice to follow you. Lord, and, and if our heart um, right now is not on board with you, I just ask that we would come to you in repentance, that we would ask that you would forgive us, that you would change our heart, and that you would make it more like yours, would make it like yours, Lord, and just ask that you would do that for each one here. And just thank you again for the opportunity to open your word and have your word speak to each one of us here today tonight, Lord, and just, just thank you. In Jesus' name, we all say, amen.